just a little bit information about YEP. Uh, YEP stands for your Ethiopian Professionals. We're a professional uh, organization that started in 2010. So we've been in this uh, for 12 years, uh, we've been serving the greater Ethiopian community in the U.S. and we've been expanding uh, in the global community as well. Uh, we have a lot of career programs, mentoring. Uh, we also uh, hold um, some trainings for our community and then also um, just informational sessions. Uh, we have a, a few programs lined up in the future. So if you want to uh, uh, follow us, please make sure to go to our website, which will be in the chat below. Um, and then as far as me, my name is Maron Desta. Again, like I mentioned, I'm the career lead for uh, YEP. And then um, I'm also a data analyst as a, a Sharia. So I'm also in the data analytics space. And I'm so excited to have uh, Bay, uh, Mesfin and Mike here with me. And then we're gonna start with them introducing themselves and then talking a little bit about their career in analytics. So Abe, do you want to get us started? Absolutely. Hey, thank you, uh, Meron and team for inviting me. It's indeed a, an honor and a privilege to be in front of uh, our future talent here. And again, thank you for inviting me. I'm very passionate about IT. I've been in the field for over 30 years now. Uh, I did both my undergraduate and graduate work in computer science. I started my career with Bad Labs uh, back in late 80s, actually, and joined IBM in early 90s, and I'm dating myself here, guys. Uh, worked for IBM about 27 years in various capacity, uh, middleware, data, analytics, and cloud, uh, both global and North America role. And I joined Oracle in 2019 uh, to run the cloud organization here for Middle East and Africa. Uh, by the way, I live in Dubai now. And my main focus is in cloud computing, uh, although data is near and dear to me. I'm very passionate about helping people and obsessed about my client success. So with that, I'm gonna turn it to uh, the next uh, speaker. Thank you. Mesfin, you wanna go ahead? Um, my name is Mesfin Tagi. Um, I work at IBM. I started working for IBM since 2018, March 2018. Um, I am a lead for Go IBM Cloud Support Go-To-Market team. Uh, what we do there is we are responsible for all data science related projects um, for Go-To-Market team. Uh, we create reports, dashboards, we provide some insights, business insights and recommendations. And also I'm a consultant for uh, IBM Digital Transform, uh, IBM Cloud Digital Transformer team. What we do is uh, we focus on client success. So we um, try to our best to make our customer happy. So that's what uh, my role is. Thank you, um, Mike. Okay, thanks, <clears throat> Maron. Obviously, it's a privilege to be uh, uh, you know uh, sharing the platform with with Abi. Obviously, distinguished resume. And also must win, but um, so I'm, I'm, you know, the most probably the most junior in this in this uh, panel. But uh, I work in the um, government contracting space um, for the past uh, two years. I was working at in the Army's um, Office of Business Transformation, working on um, you know modernizing their their defense uh, business systems um, using some data science tools and and, and and methods and things like that, and. Uh, <clears throat> About two years, I mean, uh, two, three months ago, I transitioned to a different contract with the NIH, uh, with the National Heart and Lung Institute. And um, there I'm working on uh, public facing reports on workforce data. Um, so I'm very excited to, to, to share my experience and, and talk about you know, how you know, people that are interested in data science can, can break into the field. Over, thanks. Thank you. Um, I guess my first question um, would be, if you were starting out today, what would you recommend someone to be started? Because a lot of people who are joining this call are people who are interested in dating, uh, going into data science. So um, what would be your recommendation as a starting point? Is that for me or for? It's for everyone. <laughs> I can get going here. Uh, let me just uh, give a little perspective about 
the data science and I like to uh, tie to uh, cloud computing as well because uh, with the increase of uh, with increase in, in big data companies, uh, they have no other choice but to store most most of this large set of data uh, data online in their need uh, into cloud. So it's very difficult to talk about data science without without actually coupling it with uh, cloud computing. So cloud computing by definition is to have access to different computing services like database, servers, you know, software, AI um, over the internet, which is called cloud in this case, right? So, so big data and analytics application workload are, are also moving into there. So what do, you, what do I recommend? <clears throat> so the, let's define the role, right? The role of a data scientist in this case, we're talking about data scientists, is really to use various programming skills to gather, analyze, integrate large data, uh, both structured and unstructured data, right? Mm -hmm. So what kind of, uh, how do they start? What kind of training requirements do you recommend, right? They definitely have to have that CompSci degree, R programming, and I'm sure uh, uh, the rest will talk more about that. Python coding is very important. Hadoop is very important. Uh, these are some of the requirements, right? Uh, and in terms of the tools, uh, there are open source tools as well as commercially available tools, right? Uh, you can use R or Python or Hadoop uh, in open source and in commercially available tools. You can use things like Tableau, Oracle Relational Database, Business Objects and what have you. So, for me, uh, it's so important, uh, imperative to really look at cloud computing and data science together uh, as you as you start looking into uh, into this space. And we'll talk more about that as we as we get into the discussion. I actually just want to add add on to that. So I think um, nowadays they you know when you when you're in universities, um, you know pre previously they never really had. A data science degree and like Abby said you know computer science is probably the best route to take if you wanted to get into you know the data science realm um, but I think even you know if you're not you know in that track and you can be from any other field uh, nowadays you have the, the the resources online to be able to to you know uh, uh, go on and, and, and teach yourself some of these skills Obviously, you're going to be a little behind as compared to those that, you know, are coming with a computer science degree or information systems degree and things like that. But I would highly recommend uh, platforms like Udemy, DataCamp and things like that. Even for folks that have a, a computer science degree, data science is, is, I would say, not a very new field, but it's somewhat of a new field as compared to, you know, other fields. So it's, it's something that's continuously changing. So I would say, you know, to... to for anyone that's in this space to, to utilize uh, platforms like Udemy, DataCamp, and things like that to familiarize themselves with, with new ways of doing things, right? That's that's what uh, makes this field a very dy dy dynamic one. But like Abby said, um, you, you, you need some of these basic skills to, to break into the field, right? He mentioned Python, for example. That's one tool that I would say is industry leading in terms of, uh, you know, a, some sort of a coding language, right? And then, you know, once you have that, uh, you know, for example, if you're in, in, the, in the, the government government contracting space, um, you're dealing with, with leaders, non-technical leaders. So, you know, when you do some analytics work, how do you communicate that, you know, in a, in a non-technical manner, right? So you would need, to, you know, skills and tools such as uh, Tableau to be able to communicate your findings, which I think is very important. But, um, especially in the government contracting space, which is not, uh, you know, you're not like deploying models all the time. The, the, there are, you know, cases where you do, but, you know, in cases where you don't have to deploy models and you're just, um, you know, given tasks to, to, to solve quick problems and then communicate those problems and findings or solutions to, to leadership, I would say Python and then some sort of BI tool like, um, you know, a Tableau, Power BI, Click, and things like that. So I would say to start off with Python or R, and then I would say Power BI or Tableau. So I fully agree with him. And, and obviously, um, uh, try to familiarize yourself with, with cloud computing like AWS, Azure, and things like that as well, how they work, because nowadays that's where, you know, we're, we're dealing with big data, right? 
uh, Hadoop obviously is very important as well. So I agree with everything. I just wanted to to to, to add on to to it from 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 my perspective and and to add on to uh, the fact that you know using open source. Um, um, not open source, but using um, platforms like Udemy and, and Datacom would, would, would be very useful for people that are just getting into the, this field. I think you mentioned that um, for, for beginners, especially in data science field, we, they need two things. One is the skill, the core, and also communication skills. If you, don't, if you are not able to explain your data, for hire managers, for layman people, for everyone, it's, it's just multiplying by zero because you have to be able to address your audiences. You have to be able to uh, communicate your results with the uh, concerned party. If you don't do that, I mean, all that hard work is going to be uh, for nothing. So communication, I say, is very, um, very important the second one is uh, skills you have to have you have to have the insight right if you have some kind of problem you need to know how to tackle that because one solution is not for everything so um in terms of tools uh, you mentioned it python um i'm more into the um deep learning side so i uh, i i have a link I, I just shared it for everyone it's an IBM Data Science Professional Certificate. It covers different topics. It's free for seven days, uh, and you pay maybe 39 bucks a month. So if you are able to complete all the courses listed there, then you will be certified. That's, I mean, I, rec I highly recommend, especially for beginners, to go through those topics. I mean, they cover SQL, they cover Python, different platforms like PyTorch, TensorFlow, um, they cover all uh, the machine learning algorithms uh, existing. And most importantly, they have this, prog this uh, um, program, uh, it's a capsule project. So you will be given uh, raw data and problem of statement, statement of problem. So you can use what you have learned and also you can use whatever technique you, you it's in what's in your mind, you can use whatever you want and there is ex um, expectations that set you, you, you need to meet. So I uh, really recommend um, if, if you are a beginner to go through this work, it's a certification and uh, it's not that expensive. You can audit it. If you don't wanna pay, you can audit the course. Just uh, the, the only thing is you don't get the, the certification. So um, I highly recommend that. If someone is more interested um, for example, in uh, to understand what is really the mathematics, what is really behind those algorithms. Uh, I have this book, um, we call it um, the Bible of Neural Networks. So <laughs> uh, if, if you are interested, if someone is interested to see what's behind, what's going on behind those crazy algorithms, then um, this book is written by Dr. Martin Higgins. It's very flow. The examples are very um, to the point. So I really recommend the book, that book. Um, another thing, um, sometimes some companies uh, have this exam, entrance exam, coding exam. So people ask, where do uh, I get those questions, right? So for that, I have, <laughs> two coding sites that might help um, beginners just to try to test. It's, it's, it starts from simple all the way to um, hard problem. So if, uh, if one interested, they can get it uh, through these coding sites. Um, that's pretty much about trading same tools. <laughs> Before we move to the second point, uh, I've also just put uh, uh, something on the chat uh, in reference to blogs and use cases. Actually, uh, it's a comprehensive set of uh, use case in data science. So it's very, very useful. So if you guys want to take a look at it. Yes, thank you guys so much. I'm pretty sure everybody, I have clicked on some of those buttons and um, I'm sure everybody will 
learn a great deal. And then as somebody who had gone through the interviews, HackerRank because of Lifesaver. Um, I've also noticed that a lot of companies use HackerRank to test people. So the more experience that you have, because their interface is a little bit different than what you'd see in your classes or anything like that, but it, it would still be required for you to understand it. So I would highly, highly recommend that one. And then all the courses are a great place to start. So definitely, please make sure to go to those and then um, um, look at them. I guess we can go to the second question. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about your careers. I know, especially with you, Abby and Mespin, um, I wanted to talk about what were the most pivotal moments in your career? Because of course, once you get started in the um, in, in data science, you wanna go further in your career and grow. And uh, what are the things that help you get to where you are today? Thank you, ma'am. Uh... So bear in mind, the question is not about job, about career. So uh, I want to differentiate that. Uh, it's an important question. Uh, so early, I I'll share with you my example, okay? Early in my career, uh, this again about 25, 27 years ago, uh, I had a good mentor, uh, a fellow Ethiopian, very senior person in IBM. Uh, he was a vice president, senior vice president actually. So I've actually uh, managed to identify a very good uh, you know, career coach that can help. So very important for all of you to uh, take mental note on that. So not only a mentor, but also a, you know, a personal friend, but uh, eventually the, the two things that he, he actually uh, made it clear to me at that time is to uh, uh, specialize on something that I like to do, or I love to do, or I'm very passionate about, and then stick with it, uh, stick to it. Rather. So at the end of the day, it's all about specialization and adding value. And also uh, highlighted that the importance of uh, technical acumen. There's no substitute to technical and hard work, right? So these are the two, three things he highlighted. So what I did early in my career is, uh, you know, I put time into analytics and, and eventually into cloud. So the, the point I'm trying to make here is let's not be jack of all trades. Uh, we need to highlight or uh, find our inside genius and stick to it and then add value. So down the road, this became uh, a very important uh, turning point in my career. Uh, eventually now I'm today I'm very satisfied in what I'm doing because uh, I managed to identify early in my career what's important uh, and, and then I stick with it but most importantly I'm adding value to my clients uh, with my clients in their journey to cloud uh, I'm taking an active role and then most importantly I'm also uh, adding value to their digital transformation uh, journey so my advice to all of you is take a mentor or a career coach, follow up regularly and pick an area that you find, uh, that you passion rather, or you're inside genius in this case, and invest time because you control, you don't control your uh, destiny, you control your habits. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, people will tell you that you control your destiny, but at the end of the day, you control your habit. So your habit has to be really spend time on your career, make sure that uh, it, it, uh, that uh, you spend time on your technical acumen. So that's pretty much uh, a turning point to me is to identify a, a career coach early in my career. Um, yeah, and I guess from from my perspective is is I, I agree. I think I think um, picking one specialty is, is always good, right? When I, when I was um, working at, at the army, um, I, you know, I didn't think that they were going to pay attention, but when they first asked me during the first week or, or, or two weeks of, of when I started that job, they were like, you know, what are you good at? And then I told them, you know, I'd like to to make dashboards and things like that. So. For the next two years, whenever there's a need to build a dashboard, they were like, Mike is here, Mike is there, you know? So um, sort of establishing um, your um, core skills within the work environment, I think is very good. And then being good at it as well, you know, cause you're making a statement and, and you don't think that employers pay attention, but they pay attention to, to things that you're really good at. Um, 
but I think unlike um, Avi, I, I, I can't say I had a mentor, but I had the desire and the passion, right, to learn, right? So for me, it was, um, um, uh, you know, using again, and I, I can't stress this enough, but like using these platforms like Udemy and like consistently being on there, um, trying out, you know, whenever I see new words, you know, like deep learning, natural language processing, being, you know, having the curiosity to go ahead and, and search for those terms and Udemy and, and data camp and, and taking actual the actual courses and finishing those courses. I think, you know, that passion and desire helped me sort of um, get to that level where I felt comfortable in, in doing those things in a word setting, right? Um, but on top of that, uh, it's not always implementing uh, these algorithms on Python, because to be honest, the code is out there if you really want to just implement. But like um, buying the books, like like Mesfin said, right, trying to understand a little bit how does that, you know, how the algorithms work, you know, how do you tune parameters, things like that, having that understanding so that, you know, when you're sitting on a job interview and they ask you like, you know, something deeper than just how you implement the code, you have an idea of how that, you know, code works. You have some sort of understanding of how that algorithm works and, you know, how it does what it does, right? Um, so, you know, just, I would say in this field, curiosity uh, is, is very important and, 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 and having the ability, developing that ability to be able to um, effectively, efficiently use resources that you have out there, like Stack Overflow. None of us can code, you know, 100 lines without using Stack Overflow. Let's be honest here, right? None of us can do that, really. Um, some people can, obviously, but I can't, right? So uh, knowing that there are resources out there like Stack Overflow, um, and um, not only just Googling questions, but asking questions, right? Developing that ability to ask uh, detailed questions, uh, because you know there is a community out there, and your question is also adding to the success of, of, of that community at large, right? So, it's, you know, one is, is is developing curiosity using the resources that you have available to you and, and and understanding how things work and not just learning how to, you know, just implement them because there are going to be times where you have to explain uh, the things that you're doing. And I guarantee you, you don't want to trip up when that time comes over. <laughs> so for me, uh, the pivot point that changes my career is um, there are two occasions. One is the first time when I was introduced to AI. So I had no idea about data science, no idea about AI when I was in Ethiopia. So when I took on my first semester, I took neural networks and um, stochastic systems. So I, I, I fall in love <laughs> that semester. So I asked my advisor, what should I do so that this is going to be the rest of, I want to work on this area for the rest of my life. So that's crucial moment. The second one is, um, I went to this convention, uh, National Society of Black Engineers. It's an old convention. Uh, I highly recommend engineers and data scientists to visit that because uh, 10, 000, more than 10,000 people attend yearly and there is a quota for minorities. So the people, the, the hiring managers will be there to hire. Someone is going to be hired, whether it's you or not, but someone is going to get hired because they need minorities. In addition to that, um, you, you will be hired on the spot. They will be, there will be interviews two or three within four days time frame, but you will be hired on the spot and many companies will be there. So I went there and I had only one interview with IBM. And then it was pretty much a conversation then I, I, I landed. So that was one crucial moment for me because I, I, I had the opportunity to show myself through internship. So those are the two uh, moments that changed my career trajectory. All right, and uh, while we're talking about career, um, I wanted to ask if there were any challenges that you faced um, throughout your career and how you resolved them. Yeah, so I can I can start again here. Um, so in my position, actually, the most difficult thing to do is, which is emotionally, mentally difficult, is to uh, to fire or lay off people. Uh, you know, as people manager, you do that occasionally. That's very difficult. 
and a very emotionally draining exercise. But I tell you, there is a, a lesson learned on that and, and how did I resolve it and how, how am I overcoming this problem, right? Uh, and that could be beneficial, by the way, both to, to managers and employees. Uh, so what I put together is instead of waiting until the, till the end of the year to do performance review or performance checkpoint, uh, I have regular checkpoint uh, with my top 25 percent as well as the bottom 25 percent in my organization. The beauty about doing that is you set the expectation early in their career. You set the expectation early in the cycle. You talk about it on a quarterly basis and then you continue to monitor that. So at the end of the year, if you have to lay off someone, it won't be a surprise. But most importantly, the employee would benefit from this because, and this is again, my advice to all of you listening here, uh, I would encourage you to have that career or, or performance kind of discussion with your manager on a quarterly basis and ensure that you have the right set of expectation in place and continue to follow up on that uh, by email, document that, do a checkpoint call. And then at the end of the year, you're doing what he or she or your manager is asking you to do. Mm -hmm. Then you've got really a, a good chance of continuing to, to grow with your career, but most importantly, secure your job. So, so the, the plus here is uh, I've managed to actually address my, my challenge, which is this emotionally uh, difficult exercise by, by ensuring that I have a, you know, an action in place. But, but again, uh, the, the, the added benefit here for the employee, the employees now, there is no surprise. There's no surprise element in this discussion. He or she would have exactly a clear uh, set of expectation from me in this case for them as well. Uh, and then they will continue to monitor that through the cycle. So that, that's a, the that's a benefit both for the employee as well as for the manager. So there is actually a, a methodology for this. You, you identify the situation, you put a task in place, you have an action, and then you have results. Uh, there is actually, it's, it's, a, it's a public domain, they call it STAR. Uh, situation, task, action, and results. So in that case, you can actually uh, continue to monitor this with, uh, with a defined structure of code. Uh -huh. So, um, Mike, uh, anyone can continue? Um, sure. Um, and I think Avi and, and Masfin can add on to, you know, from their, their own unique experiences uh, on, on what I'm going to say now. But I think for me, uh, the biggest challenge, and I think it applies to, to any field, is, is this workplace politics, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and what I mean by workplace politics is, is um, for, for example, in the government contracting space, at least, and like I said, I'm a junior, so I'm still uh, very early on in my career. But uh, what, what I've seen um, both, you know, when I was at the Navy in the Army and even currently at the NIH, what I'm seeing is, um, for example, when I, when I was in the Army, uh, we, we had our office is called the Office of Business Transformation. So what we're trying to do is streamline uh, things for different offices uh, and, and, and solve their, their, their data problems. But uh, what I realized is because we don't own any data, uh, some, some offices uh, or, or their, their data science department were, were very hesitant to, to, to give us their data because if we are able to do certain things within a, sp a specific amount of time, and if we're do able to do it quote unquote better than what they're able to do, then, you know, we're making them look bad. So they're very, you know, they're holding on to their data, very hesitant to give us their data um, and, and things like that. So that's uh, common across, uh, I would say, I don't know how it is in the, in the, the uh, private sector, but in the government contracting space, that's very common. And uh, it goes back to what Mustafa said earlier, although he said it in the context of communicating your findings, data findings, but in this case, how do you, you know, communicate in a way to, to your leadership and across different offices so that, you know, you're not really intimidating them in terms of what you're able to do, but, you know, making them feel like you're working really as a team um, and, and you're, you know, in the same, you know, you have the same vision and the same mission, which is uh, uh, making the army the best 
it can be, right? For in, in, in my example. So I would say workplace politics. And I know Abi and, and Mesfin have uh, 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 more experience in this. So I would, uh, you know, uh, let them add on to this. Uh, but another challenge, um, uh, there's a different one is, is when you're in the data science field and when you're um, changing jobs, the way things work are different. The way um, the tools are different, um, the way they, 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 they share code could be different, things like that. So making sure that you know, you're flexible enough and, and showing that aptitude to be a fast learner. And I think that's one thing that uh, from what I hear, I've never hired somebody, but maybe Abby can talk could talk a little bit about this, but but um, showing your aptitude, your 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 willingness to be flexible, to to learn and to adapt to, to new environments and new structures, uh, uh, in the workplace. So, I think uh, those could be challenges, but they're challenges that, um, with time and experience, um, you can easily deal with. Over. Yeah, the most challenging moment for me is um, during my internship. So. Abi may know that the IBM at IBM there is a war room. So yep. people from fellow to CTOs to regular employees sit in a, in a big room, maybe 15 to 20 people. So on my first day, the team I was supposed to uh, join, it, it was not there because there was a problem with a, an important client. So they are in a war room. So nobody gave me attention. So what they did was they just put me to sit there and just learn. The first week, I don't know. I, 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 it, it is as if they are speaking another language. I don't know what they were talking about. It's the, the acronyms, the, the terminologies. It's so hard even to, to understand what's, what was going on. And I, they didn't have time for me to ask them. So we start at 8 a.m. and then leave 7. Lunch will be served inside the room. Nobody gets out. So what I started to do was um, start making notes, just writing the terminologies and the, the acronyms. And during night time, I started to looking into <laughs> do research by, my, by, my, by myself. Then on the second week, there was a fellow, um, the highest standard for the technical ability in IBM. She was there and she asked me if I want to change a team. But by that time, at the second week, I was able to understand the problem, what was going on. So I didn't want to leave. So I asked her, do you have historic data for this problem? She said, yes, but what are you going to do with it? Uh, let me try a root cause analysis. Let me try something. Give me the data and leave, just leave me. She gave me the data, she put me in a cubicle and nobody saw me afterwards. Then two weeks before um, the end of my internship, I did what I promised, which is root cause analysis. And then um, I created a system that can predict the occurrence of that problem in future time horizon. So the result was not that good. But she was, I mean, it, it was an indicative that if they do something, if they spend time, it will be a good solution. So they, we filed the patent and I got hired a month ago. But the, the most um, important part is I didn't want to, uh, I, didn't, I was not looking for my comfort. I, because, I mean, I don't know anything about um, the problem, I, I have never heard of those words, but uh, I knew that I can at least contribute something to that problem, and that was my challenging moment. Yeah, I actually, there's one quote uh, from ex IBM CEO, Ginny Rameli uh, Comfort and growth, they don't go together. They don't, they don't go together. So you did exactly what, uh, you know. Uh, what a credible person expected to do. So uh, kudos to you, uh, outstanding, yeah. kudos. To I think I just want to follow a little bit, follow up a little bit more on that, um, especially given our culture, I think we're more of like a humble 
Oh, yeah. um, like we don't like bragging about our accomplishments and stuff, but when it comes to, you know, a career path in the Western world, you have to be able to advocate for yourself. Is that something, if, if that's something that anyone of you struggled with, um, do you have any um, advice for people? Because if you don't advocate for yourself, then you might not get noticed or, you know, you might just be a flying or like, you know, <laughs> stuck somewhere there and not get that much of a career growth. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say something about that. It's the same concept as, um, you know, Nike uh, spending millions and millions of dollars to, to advertise their brand, right? If they didn't do that, then we're not going to buy their products, right? Or if some other company uh, has a better marketing plan or strategy and something that captures the interest of consumers, then you know they're probably going to have more sales as compared to Nike or whatever brand, right? I think it's the same case. You have to be able to uh, uh, break that uh, uh, cultural sort of restraint, um, and then learn how to advertise yourself and your skills. It doesn't have to sound like you're, you know, making yourself uh, sound like you're better than this person or that person or the group or whatever, but. There's absolutely no problem with with uh, marketing, sort of your skills, your abilities, and things like that. Absolutely not. And I don't think that. Uh, but obviously, you have to sort of know the way you're 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 saying certain things and, and how you're coming off. But uh, it's the same deal as this. What they call the elevator spe speech, right? Mm -hmm. uh, making sure that you have your elevator speech down. And when you're on an, in an interview setting, having that ability to, to market your, your strengths, your skills, and things like that, or else it's, it's going to be, it's difficult to, to it's because it's a very highly competitive world, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's trying to get somewhere. Everybody's trying to accomplish something. And uh, the way you stand out is, in my opinion, um, through your ability to, to market yourself. And uh, like you said, I think Ethiopian culture sort of, uh, uh forces you to, to be humble uh but uh you know we're not in Ethiopia anymore we're in America right so we have to learn and adapt so that's that's my advice it's over I have one one <clears throat> in, in instance so we, we we were sitting in a uh, office while while I was in a school we so with my friend we did some projects different projects when visitors comes in, my friend was explaining what I did last year. He was explaining my project. When he was explaining my project, I was like, what? This is how I should explain to other people because I mean, he did a better job than what I, I, would, uh, I would do. So ex being able to explain and show off what you are capable of is not, uh, not being happened it's uh, it's showing what you can uh, you can do did, did he explain it on your behalf uh, or did he explain it as if he's he he has on my behalf so on your behalf that's yes, on my behalf usually usually that's un, it's unusual which is very good by the way uh I <laughs> so you you definitely have a good friend there <laughs> yeah i was i was sitting just sitting doing my work and he brought the visitors so he's explaining what we are doing in that office. He's doing this, he's doing that. But when he explained what I did and what I was working on, it was impressive. So, I mean, we need to, you're right, we need to um, take out our, <laughs> whatever it is that bearing us and then shine. Yeah. yeah. So, so let me add a, a comment here. Uh, first of all, uh, Mike, I totally agree with you. you. You clearly have to showcase your work. You have to uh, you have to differentiate yourself, and, and most importantly, you really have to take full advantage of uh, the resources available to you. Because in companies like IBM, in your case, Masfin, and I'm sure in your company as well, Mike, there are lots of resources. Mm -hmm. Usually, we're not very good in taking full advantage of the resources that are around us. So take full advantage of that. Differentiate yourself. Work ethics, there is no substitute to hard work. And, and really uh, invest in technical skills. 
you did exactly that, Ms. Flynn, because that's exactly why uh, the person you, you've uh, just mentioned uh, went out of his way to, uh, to promote your work, uh, which is very good. And, and I, I cannot emphasize on the importance of identifying a career coach or a mentor to have that kind of uh, dialogue. And then build your network, right? When I say network, it's not about who you know, it's who knows you. There's a difference, right? When I say network, it's about who knows you. So build, build your network, make sure to spend time uh, on your, with your mentor and, and invest in your technical skills. I cannot, I cannot emphasize on that, on the importance of that. But, but clearly, uh, Mike, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, you, you have to um, showcase, highlight, promote. You make the headline as opposed to reporting the news, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, and just just to add on to that, I think, uh, you know, it could be just human nature, but, uh, you know, when, when we are doing, when we are branding ourselves, when we are marketing ourselves and our skills, um, the, the, there, it's a delicate balance between, uh, you know, uh, marketing yourself and your skill sets and creating a brand for yourself in the work environment versus, you know, uh, limiting or at least not intimidating uh, the person that, uh, you know, is interviewing you or, or, or your colleagues, because um, let's face it, um, you know, sounds good when I say, you know, go ahead and market yourself to the, uh, uh, to, to your fullest, but I think there's a, you know, a balance that, that we need to strike there to, to make sure that, uh, you know, we're not sounding arrogant or intimidating colleagues and, and, and things like that. And um, I would say, and I think this is uh, the uh, uh, differentiating sort of uh, factor here is, is and, and, and doing that, I think we need to keep in mind that company's ultimate objective, right? At the end of the day, in the private sector, it's money, right? Uh, it, it's the success of that specific team that you're uh, looking to work for. So when you're, you know, marketing your skill sets, we have to be cognizant of the fact that you're, or you have to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, there is a team out there that's already established. So what you're really aiming to do is, 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 is highlighting your skill sets, your core strengths, in a way that you and communicating it in a way where you know you coming into the existing team is going to add value right not that you're going to come here and disrupt the way things are working uh, because you think you're different or because you think you have the, these better skill sets and this and that but how do you add value to this already existing structure and i think that's what I would say the employer is going to really appreciate right or the hiring manager is going to appreciate because uh, they're looking for how you can come into this team uh, and adding value to this team. And then this team, now that you're adding value to, can contribute to the overall success of the company or, or the mission if it's a government, right? So just keep in mind that data science, yes, also just in the general picture, I just wanted to add this, but uh, data science, yes, you can implement, you can build models, you can deploy models, you can create dashboards, but you have to, uh, especially in the interview process, um, you have to make sure that whatever models you're creating, what did they accomplish? Did it you know, reduce cost to that company? I think highlight that. I think that's very important because people can build models, people can build dashboards, what, but what did it accomplish, right? At the end of the day, if you're not making money, the company's not making money, you don't have a job. So that's what we need to, to focus on as well. Over. <laughs> Um, and I have uh, the last question for me, um, and this is, uh, I guess, more towards um, Abi and Masfin. Um, how have you seen the industry change in the last five years, and how do you expect it to change in the next five to ten years? Okay, so the industry you're referring to is the data, I'm sure, the mm -hmm. analytics space. Um, so in data analytics, uh, let me just uh, share with you the, the maturity level of data analytics in general, right? There's a various maturity level over the past five years uh, from descriptive to diagnostics, from predictive to prescriptive. So which is descriptive is like describing, understanding the data. That's 
early in the maturity cycle. And then you, you have clients looking for diagnostics, going deeper, historical, that kind of thing. Actually going deeper, the historical piece comes into predictive space. And then you get into prescriptive, which is really introducing uh, ML, AI, deep learning, quantum, and what have you. So, so we came a long way here. Uh, so you, you'll find clients at a different stage of that maturity level over the course of the last five years. So if you take, uh, you know, looking ahead, what we're seeing here in our industry is the upsurge of uh, big data, right? So this upsurge of big data introduced two important terminology, right? Data science and data analytics. So data science, the way I look at it is, is really uh, an umbrella that encompasses data analytics. So a data scientist, you know, they create the questions, right? While a data analyst find the answer to the existing set of questions. So the point I'm trying to make here is uh, going forward, looking, this is today. So now I gave you the picture of where, where we were in the last five years, right? From prescriptive all the way to prescriptive. Now today we're talking about data science and analytics. Going forward to Meron's question, where do you see this is going in the next five years? To me, what's uh, important and the Gartners and the Forsters and uh, the IDCs of the world continue to confirm that clients are going to use cloud. So what's gonna be big in the future is data as a service. Data as a service uh, will become more widespread solution for data integration, you know, management, storage, and, and businesses will continue to use uh, turning into cloud to modernize uh, their infrastructure and, and workload. So I see data as a service coming in the future. So. Uh, I'm not sure if you want to add a few other things here. Yeah, um, first I ask for who? I mean, for who? If you look at the tools um, five years back, now we have a lot of tools, a lot of algorithms, easier to implement, very simple um, for customers, for the end user. But for the creator, they are highly sophisticated they are highly complicated. So I believe this will continue in the future, but one problem um, I, uh, I am seeing now and that will sustain in, in the future is that since there is uh, a demand, high demand for data scientists, and since there are many, many tools and algorithms, people don't understand what's going on behind the scene. They just put input, take the output, and they trust too much, and they rely on um, the, the tools. That's very scary for me, because if you don't critically think and um, question the results, then uh, it's, it's kind of scary for me. <laughs> very important. Very important. Yeah, I was told uh, my um, my engineering professor always says that you have to look under the hood yes. and understand what's going on. And also, um, they uh, my classes emphasize that you, you, there's no black box solutions. You have to implement everything from um, every step of the way because then you, I think I've seen a lot of issues where people implement some things and they don't understand what the, act the output actually means. And um, I think that that's definitely an area that uh, people need to invest in. Yeah, I think um, just to add, to add on to what Mason said, you, you're right, right? You have to understand what's, what's behind the scenes because if you're just taking the output and that's all you care about, you know, oh, people look at the performance metrics and choose, oh, the accuracy is this percent, not ah, this. How about if the model is overfitting, right? Yeah. Are you checking for that? Things like that, I think, are really important, and I think that's that's I think you know um, in this in this field, you know, uh, important to know because because when you're when you're in a, in a hardcore data science team, yeah. uh, these things matter and they make the difference, right? Yeah. So add to add one thing. So for example, in a data where uh, ninety nine percent of 
the data is one class and just one percent of uh, the data is another class the network or the model by just guessing it's 99 percent accurate yeah but it's not accurate <laughs> so <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's very important to understand yeah. what the results are yep i agree <laughs> Um, we're going to go shortly into the uh, um, attendees' questions, but I also wanted to just emphasize, uh, just to thank our panelists so much uh, for coming in and sharing their wisdom with us today. Um, I also want to let everyone know, I think it should be in the chat, but um, to go to our website if they want to join in in future events where we talk about career career pathing and all of that. We also have uh, training programs uh, that we provide. Um, we are also always welcoming volunteers, so please make sure to do that. Um, I also wanted to say that we do have a career a dedicated career team that helps individuals get jobs uh, in the market. So if you're interested, um, there's going to be a link below to, for a survey, and then we'll contact you afterwards to get more information so that um, you'll be, we'll be able to help you through your career journey. And then I think um, for the questions, um, Red, do you want, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I have, um, yeah, so Um, I think the first question, um, uh, the first question, I think we talked about a little bit earlier, but is how do you keep up with new technologies um, while you're always already in the industry? Because, you know, the data science field is always changing and new things are coming in. At IBM, um, we have Friday, fr Friday afternoon dedicated to teach yourself. So you, 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 use, you utilize that time to learn more. I think this is um, more of a general question, right? How do you keep up? It's up to the individual, right? The individual need to, I think we talked about that uh, in a greater detail earlier about the importance of investing in your technical skills, uh, continue to stay uh, to attend the conferences, to, to be able to uh, attend blogs and, and ensure that uh, participate on some of these big forums. Uh, so there's so many, so many places where you can, uh, you can, uh, you know, continue to, to extend your skills. Yeah, I think um, if you're looking for um, websites and things like that, that publish articles on um, new things in this field, I would say, I think, what is it, medium.com is, 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 is a good, uh, I think if you, if you type in medium.com, data science or something like that on Google, um, just reading those articles because they uh, uh, publish new articles on, on, on new uh, ways of doing things, new technologies and things like that in this field. Uh, but again, I think this is what my fourth or fifth time stressing. Udemy, DataCamp, things like that. They publish new v videos on, on how to do, uh, on, on latest technologies, latest algorithms, uh, and things like that. So just um, frequently visiting those sites, I think, are a good place to start, in my opinion. Sorry, I was muted. Um, I also wanted, I think someone asked, um, do you have any advice for someone who is intimidated by programming for people who are just starting out uh, or looking into pivoting um, within their career? I think uh, Abby is raising his hand. So no, no, go go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I don't have uh, no. You can go ahead. I, I don't have any you know pressing thing to say here. <laughs> Advice on career, uh, Meron? Is that just? I just I asked because I want to get clarity on the question, so I answered this question very carefully. That's why. Well. 
Yeah, I think it's people who are not, who do not have that programming background. Um, they're just intimidated by just, you know, um, programming and all of that. And I mean, I can, talk, I can talk a little bit because I come from non-coding background and I work in, in data science. I could talk a little bit if that would help, uh, mm -hmm. but that's what everybody's asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good, 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 good question, by the way, because not everyone is coming from uh, the, the programming aspect. I tell you, uh, I'll give you an example. My, my son, uh, he never took any kind of computer science class. Uh, he is now in, in, uh, in a different industry. Uh, he works for Facebook, actually. And uh, he took Python on his own. I mean, if you have undergraduate degree and some aptitude, high level aptitude, you can actually pick it up according to him. You can pick it up on your own. So Python is something that you can probably learn on your own. That's one thing I would highly recommend you do. And he did that and, uh, and he enjoyed it actually. So it's, it's about, you know, if you have the passion, I strongly believe that you can learn uh, Python coding and, uh, and just maybe high level understanding of Tableau, you know, it's just a discovery tool, uh, that kind of thing. So that would be, I would start with Python. That would be my, my situation. Yeah, I think just to add on to that, I think Python, uh, it is something that you can, you know, pick up uh, very quickly. Um, but I think the best advice here is, is to take it um, one day at a time and, um, you know, um, if you if you if you um, take an online course for let's say you know two to three weeks and you get the basics of it, I think just the curiosity itself will not let you sleep. You'll 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 start to code more and more because you 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 get you know become more happy the more you know. So you don't want to stop, right? So just take it one step at a time and don't get frustrated when something doesn't run or something doesn't work out the way it should. Um, Python is is I would say is a very is, is easy as compared to other language yes. other programs like Abi said right so it's something that that can be uh, picked on uh, very quickly but be patient be patient and uh, take it uh, uh, one day at a time. Yeah, and um, I highly like as a person who came from I did my undergrad in uh, biology and chemistry. Uh, all my data analysis was pretty much in Excel. So um, from that background to go into data analytics, I would say Python is, was the easiest language to learn. It's very intuitive. It's not it's a little bit further from like machine language. So it's much easier to understand. Um, I would say just, I, I learned Python on my own to begin with. And then I went back to school to learn a bit more. I think I the way I did it was focus on one thing. So I focused on Python for a little bit and I made sure I got that. And then I went to SQL because I wanted to do more relational databases. So I like, I literally took jobs that specialize in that area so that I would have hands-on experience. And then I did uh, Power BI and Tableau and all of them. And now I'm in uh, a course that I'm doing my master's in data analytics, which focuses on like the mathematics behind it, because yes, I could deploy these programs, but I wanted to understand what's behind them and why they are like, you know, what the output means and what the mathematics is behind it. And that has been extremely helpful. So um, if you're wondering, that's another pathway to take if you don't have the background. And, um, exactly, Meron. Well said. Good examples. Very good. And I think the last question, I apologize, we're running a little bit late. Uh, and if you, any of the panelists have to go, I would uh, feel free to do so. Um, but the last question is, uh, people were asking if there are any networking organizations. Uh, we have a network, obviously, but it's tailored to every professional. Do you know if there are any networking um, possibilities for Ethiopians in the data science field? Um, and, and feel free to say you don't know of one. I'm not familiar with one, but maybe Ms. Finn or Mike. Um, I, I, I can't remember the name on the top of my mind, but there is... Um, community, Ethiopian community working on AI and other stuff, which was led by uh, Timbit. Uh, I, will, I will send you the link whenever I get the, the chance. All right. 
uh, but I, I don't know the name on top of my mind. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not aware of one. Uh, one thing yeah. I'll say is um, our uh, Yep has a community site um, that's dedicated to the professional network, and uh, we're creating. There are different like there are different groups you can go to. So there's one uh, group for like PMs. There is one specifically for computer science, and all of this. Then uh, there's there will be one for data analytics too, so that you can look at the professionals in your. Um, like within our network that are working in data analytics so that you can learn more about their career and then uh, reach out to them if, uh, if you want to learn more. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, we don't know, I don't know one, so I apologize, but yeah, um, I think that's all the questions that we have. We have addressed some of the uh, ones. Um, um, I think um, that's all we have. Thank you so, so, so much for joining us. I even, I learned a lot from this uh, one and I can't imagine what the attendants are uh, getting from this. Um, thank you again. And then um, uh, as always, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me um, and then also join the uh, YEP network to look at future upcoming events. Um, everybody here, uh, I think are all on LinkedIn. So if you wanna reach out to them, feel free to do so. They're very responsive. They've responded to me several times. Um, so yeah, um, thank you guys so much. If there is um, there are any more uh, ones, we'll, we'll reach out.